بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد my dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to class number nine the second to cla- last class of our series where we will be covering the chapter of the laughter of the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and this is a, a very special chapter because for the most part, we've been discussing how the Prophet ﷺ used to conduct himself, how he used to dress, how he used to eat, the struggles he went through, the worship of the Prophet ﷺ. And now we get to see the laughter of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ and what are some of the things that actually made him laugh. So I'm really looking forward to discussing this chapter with you. So those of you that are following along, we are on chapter number 35. قال المؤلف رحمنا الله وإياه باب ما جاء في ضحك رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم The reports pertaining to the laughter of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم So from the chapter heading itself, we see that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم did laugh but it's also important to understand that something that we've learned about the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم so far is that everything is done in moderation and you'll see that the vast majority of times when he's reported to have laughed, he's actually just smiling. Yet there are very few instances where the Prophet ﷺ did laugh to the degree that his molar teeth could be seen. One of the commentators on this chapter, he states that if you were to look for a guiding principle in this chapter, you see that when it comes to matters of this dunya, that is when the Prophet ﷺ smiles. But when it comes to matters of the Akhirah, that is when the Prophet ﷺ actually laughs. And the term laughing and smiling are actually used interchangeably in the Arabic language. So let us begin. Hadith 226, Jabir ibn Samurah radiallahu anhu narrated, The legs of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, were slightly thin. His laugh was only that of a smile. Every time I looked at him, I would think that kohol had been applied to his eyes even though it hadn't, even though it hadn't. So here they're describing the legs of the Prophet Sallallahu and he was strong, yet they were slightly thin, meaning that the Prophet Sallallahu had very little fat on his body. He had very little fat on his body. He was trim and lean and strong. And this was actually considered a praiseworthy characteristic during the time of the Arabs. And that is why the narrator of the Hadith actually mentioned it. And then this hadith specifically mentions that the laugh of the Prophet Sallallahu was just a smile. Meaning that when he was in a good mood, and you will see from this rest of the chapter that he's almost always in a good mood, that he was always smiling. So when the Prophet Sallallahu is in a really good mood and something funny does happen, that is when the Prophet Sallallahu smiles. And he says that every time I looked at him, meaning that he would constantly look back and forth, up and down, just because he didn't want to seem as if he was staring at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not a polite thing to do. He said, every time I looked at him, it would look like he had kohal on his eyes, meaning he had that mascara look on his eyes due to how dark and deep his eyelashes were. But in reality, I knew that he didn't. And this is just uh, to comment on the beautiful eyes of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the eyelashes that he had. We mentioned previously that the eyelashes of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were long and he did have dark, beautiful eyes. He did have dark, beautiful eyes. <clears throat> Hadith 227, Abdullah ibn Harith radiallahu anhu narrated, I never saw a person who smiled more than the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, <clears throat> please excuse me. <clears throat> and Hadith 228, Abdullah ibn Harith, again, he reports, he narrated the laughter of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was but a smile. So Abdullah ibn Harith, he's narrating both a Hadith. He's narrating both a Hadith. Number one is that I didn't see anyone that smiled more than the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And number two, <clears throat> the laughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the vast majority of times was just a smile. Now, we need to comment and, and, and talk about a couple of things over here. Number one, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had this wonderful, loving characteristic about him that any time someone came up to him, any time someone knocked to the door, any time someone came across him, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would welcome them with his smile before he would welcome them with their words. So before he would say, Assalamu Alaikum, he would lock eyes with them, he would smile at them, and then say the greeting of peace, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh, or respond to it as well. And this is such a beautiful characteristic to have. And my dear brothers and sisters, if you're able to implement this in your own life, that before 
you uh, greet someone with your words, you greet them with your eyes, and you greet them with a smile that you're happy to see them, you're happy to be in their presence, it makes people feel so loved. It makes people feel so welcomed. And that is how the Prophet Sallallahu was able to, to get that, you know, um, first impression right, right off the bat by smiling and by being happy in their presence. Yet even though when you look at the Prophet Sallallahu life, it's filled with a lot of difficulty and particularly pertaining to, you know, the fear of the Ummah and pertaining to the events of the hereafter, the Prophet Sallallahu has a lot to be worried about. And this shows us such maturity and such a high level of emotional intelligence that the Prophet Sallallahu is able to navigate and manage his own emotions and present the emotions that are needed at that time to gain the love, trust, uh, of the individual that he's interacting with. And this is like the epitome and the, the highest level of emotional intelligence that we see from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number two is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is always smiling. So even when things aren't going his way, they're always looking to him for advice. They're always looking to him you know, for a reaction. And when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is calm and collected, the Ummah is calm and collected. Yet if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was to worry and to, to get angry or to, to be afraid, then the Ummah would have been afraid and angry uh, as well. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't want that to happen. And that is why he was constantly seen smiling. He was constantly seen smiling. And then Abdullah ibn Harith radiallahu anhu, he reports that the vast majority of the times his laughter was just a smile. And this goes back to moderation, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't laugh about matters of this dunya. He laughed about matters of the hereafter, yet he would smile about the, the matters to the, of this dunya. He would smile about the matters of this dunya. So meaning that he was always an optimistic person, that he was always able to find good in every worldly situation, in every circumstance, he was always able to find good. And that positive mindset is so important. Now, I, I want to highlight something over here that with everything that is going on in Palestine, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them victory and uplift the oppression and the darkness that they are in and protect them from their oppressors uh, and keep them safe and accept their, their dead as martyrs and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cure their injured. Allahumma ameen. You know, it, it's very hard to find the silver lining that with all that is going on, how do you find optimism? But the reality is, my, my dear brothers and sisters, nothing happens except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you know that your Lord is in, in control, then that is something to be happy about. That is something to be optimistic about. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not allow anything to happen in vain. And yes, narratives can be twisted in this life. The media can be against the, the people of, of Palestine. But at the end of the day, who escapes on the Day of Judgment? No one. And who will be victorious on the Day of Judgment? It will be those that are oppressed. And right now, we know that those people that are, that are being oppressed May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help them and keep them safe. The du'as that they are making, they are the ones that are having an impact on this world that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, hasn't destroyed it already. Allahu Akbar. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in every circumstance, he found that silver lining. He was positive and optimistic. And that is what we need to be as well. It doesn't mean that you're not angry at the situation. Yes, be angry at the situation, but do not despair and do not, you know, inspire pessimism into others uh, as well. But rather be positive and strive for, for positive change um, and inspire people with optimism as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do. Hadith 229, Abu Dhar narrated that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I know the person who will enter paradise first and I also know the last person to be taken out of the hellfire. On the day of judgment, a person will be brought forward and then it shall be commanded that all of the minor sins of that person be put forward on him and the major sins be concealed. Then it will be said to him, on such a day you did this and on such a day you did this. He will attest to this without protest while being filled with anxiety due to the pending disclosure of his major sins. Then it shall be commanded that for every sin of that person he be given a good deed. Upon hearing this, the Messenger of Allah, upon hearing this, the person says, I still have many sins left to account for that I do not find here. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu related, By Allah, I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam laughing 
until his more t molar teeth began to show. Allahu Akbar. This is such a beautiful hadith. So Abu Huraira, uh, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu is narrating that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is saying, I know who the first person is to enter Jannah and I know who the last person is to leave Jahannam. I know who the last person is to leave Jahannam. So now the obvious uh, questions you want to ask is who is the first person to be entered into Jannah? And that is none other than the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam himself. In fact, the, uh, the angels that are guarding the gates of Jannah, they've specifically been commanded, do not let anyone in until Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam himself enters it. Do not let anyone in until him, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam himself enters it. So he's the first person to enter Jannah. Now, we know about the last person to leave Jahannam. And this is something that's important to understand, that there's going to be two types of people in Jahannam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from it and make us from those that are entered into Jannah without hisab. Allahumma ameen. Two categories of people. You have the believers and the disbelievers. The disbelievers are going to remain in Jannah, uh, are going to remain in Jahannam and they're not going to be entered into it. They're going to remain in Jahannam and they're not going to be allowed to exit from it. And then you have the believers who are sinful after they've served their time then eventually they too will be entered into Jannah. And we're going to be getting into that later on, on the types of believers that enter into Jannah uh, later on and what that uh, interaction actually looks like with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those are the two categories of people that are in Jahannam, the believers and the disbelievers. So here we have the final believer that is exiting uh, Jahannam, the final believer that is exiting Jahannam. And his reckoning is taking place at this time and all of his sins have been presented. All of his minor sins have been presented. And he is petrified. He's absolutely scared out of his mind that if this is my reckoning for the minor sins that I have committed, then what about when my major sins are committed, are presented? What about when my major sins are presented? But then out of nowhere, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he commands that for every sin that he has, and remember, these are just the minor sins that have been brought forth, for every minor sin that has been presented, a good deed is presented as well. Now, why is that the case? Well, we refer to uh, Surah Al-Furqan, verse number 70. Verse number 70, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمِلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلَ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا Except for those people that believe, repent, and do righteous deeds, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace their sins with good deeds on the Day of Judgment. So this man, as we said, he was a believer. He had iman, he had some righteous deeds, and he had repented for his sins, or at least for some of them. And due to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him a good deed for every sin that he did. Now this man is overjoyed. He's like, Allahu Akbar. Like he's amazed that I could not ask for anything more. But then eventually, all of the good deeds come to an end. And he says, oh Allah, but I have such and such sins that you didn't hold me accountable for. What about the good deeds that I'm supposed to get for those sins? And that is when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam laughed. That is when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam laughed. That even in the year after, you know, mankind doesn't lose their greed. They want their greed of the, of the blessings of Jannah, of the virtues of Jannah. That even he's, he's like, expose my sins, I don't mind. As long as I get to those good deeds that I've been getting. As long as I get those good deeds that I've been getting. And that is when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam laughed. And this is one of the first instances that we see that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is laughing, right? It's pertaining to a matter of the Akhirah where this person had despaired, thinking that he was going to be destroyed, but then all of a sudden his mood drastically changes, changes because those good deeds are presented to him in exchange for his sins and he becomes overjoyed. And that shows us the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And my dear brothers and sisters, if we've learned anything this Ramadan, it is about the infinite mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been with us. The fact that He allowed us to be alive and granted us tawfiq to worship Him and granted us the ability to, to fast and to pray and to make dua and to make dhikr and to give sadaqah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only grants that to those whom He loves. And that is a big blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grants us the tawfiq to be grateful to Him as well. Allahumma ameen. Now we get to hadith number 230. Jarir bin Abdullah radiallahu anhu narrated, from the day I accepted Islam, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam never prevented me from entering upon him and every time he saw me, he would laugh. 
So Jarir bin Abdullah radiallahu anhu, he, act- he accepted Islam approximately a month before the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Approximately a, a month before the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now you can imagine someone that's newly accepted Islam, they always want to be in the company of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They always want to learn, they always want to ask questions, they always want to see how he interacts with people, they want to see the advice that he gives to people, and he always wants to be there. And Jarir bin Abdullah radiallahu anhu, he says that every time I entered upon him, no matter who was there with him, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa never prevented me from being in his company and learning from him and benefiting from him. And on top of that, he would smile at me. He would smile at me. And I told you, he had this wonderful characteristic of showing love uh, towards people before he even spoke with his eyes and his smile before he greeted them with a greeting of peace. And that is what Jarir bin Abdullah radiallahu anhu remembered from that little time of approximately 30 days or so before the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that every time he went to go and ask him or to benefit from him, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa greeted him with a smile and never deprived him and never deprived him. And this shows us that, you know, there are people that we will come across in life that are, are genuinely interested in learning, are genuinely inquisitive about Islam. And you have to take the time to educate them. You have to take the time to connect them to the resources that they need. And more importantly, you have to help build their faith, not just through knowledge itself, but through your character. Not through the knowledge itself, but through the character. Jarir bin Abdullah radiallahu anhu, he doesn't mention all the things that he learned from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He says, he never stopped me from entering. And every time I saw him, he smiled at me. Every time I saw him, he smiled at me. Hadith 231. Uh, Jari bin Abdullah, and this is a continuation, uh, radiallahu anhu narrated, from the day I accepted Islam, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa never prevented me from entering upon him, and every time he saw me, he would smile. Hadith 232, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu narrated, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, I know the last of the people of hell to be brought forth, and the last of the people of paradise to enter therein. It will be a man who will emerge crawling from hell and Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala will say to him, go and enter paradise. He will come to it and it will appear full to him. He will go back and say, O oh Lord, I found it full. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala will say to him, do you remember your time on earth? The man answers, yes, I do. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala will say to him, make a wish. And so the man makes a wish. And then Allah the Most High says to him, you will have that which you wished and 10 times as much. He will say, are you mocking me or laughing at me? Yet you are the sovereign. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, and I saw the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa laugh so that his molar teeth appeared. Allahu Akbar. Now, this is a very similar hadith to the hadith of Abu Dhar. Now, did this incident happen a second time? And the answer seems yes. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is using this narration to inspire his companions with hope that you should be striving for the highest levels of Jannah. And this is something I want to highlight, that we as believers, the Prophet ﷺ has told us that if you ask Allah, ask Allah for the highest level of Jannah, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for al-firdaus al-a'la. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us al-firdaus al-a'la. And that is what you work towards. But this hadith is showing us that even if you don't get into al-Firdaus al-Ala and we're hoping and we're praying that we do, let us look at the state of the last man to enter into Jannah. So this man has left Jahannam. He's crawling out of Jahannam, just barely made it alive. The last believer to leave Jahannam. He's just barely made it alive. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, go to Jannah. And this man gets to the gates of Jannah and he looks around and all he sees is the inhabitants of Jannah. He sees houses, but they're all occupied. He sees gardens, but they're all taken. He sees all the luxuries of Jannah, but none of them belong to him. And he comes back defeated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thinking that, man, I thought I made it out of Jannah and I was going to be entered into Jannah. But oh Allah, there's no space in Jannah. And this is something that needs to be highlighted. That this man's understanding is one of restriction. You know how there's a limited amount of things in this life? Well, Jannah is infinite. You can have whatever you want, wherever you want, however you want, whatever you want, you know, the, the, the spiel. And this man, he's asked by Allah, do you remember your time in the dunya? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask him this? 
He asks him this to tell him that you're no longer in the dunya. Does this look like the dunya to you? Does this look like the dunya to you? And the man says, yes, I remember it. And at that time, some of the scholars also mentioned that he's asked to remember the dunya, to remember the most luxurious and fanciest and glamorous things that he can remember. Because right after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks him, ask for whatever you want. Ask for whatever you want. And this man asks for it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him 10 times that amount. 10 times that amount in comparison to that of the dunya. In comparison to that of the dunya. And this is a reminder for us to remember that verse in, in, uh, in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us, لَهُمْ مَا يَشَاءُونَ فِيهَا وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيدٌ That they will have each and every single thing that they desire and we will still have more to give them. Allahu Akbar. You will have each and every single thing that you desire and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will still have more to give you. What does that even mean? How can you have more than you desire? Are we not insatiable? Does that mean our cravings, our desires will be satisfied and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us more than that? Like, how do you do that? What does that mean? And that is the beauty of Jannah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining over here. That you can ask for whatever you want and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will exceed your expectations by at least 10 times. Remember, this man is the last person to leave Jahannam and to enter, be entered into Jannah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him 10 times of what he desired. 10 times of what he desired. Then what about the righteous that when they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Imagine how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them. And that has to be the ultimate motivational factor, my dear brothers and sisters, that when you're looking for that motivation to be good, to do those extra deeds in these final couple of nights, literally, we have two nights left, subhanAllah, how quickly it is going by. Or actually, it's the last night of Ramadan, and then tomorrow night is the night of Eid, right? So, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, how fast the, the time goes. SubhanAllah, Allahu Akbar. To get to the point, that is the generosity of Allah. Can you imagine how much He will give to the righteous when they ask of Allah? If the last person to enter Jannah is getting 10 times what He's asking for, how about those that are at the forefront? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from them. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard this, that um, the man turned back to Allah and he says, Oh Allah, are you mocking me? Like, are you making fun of me? Who am I to get 10 times of what I've asked for, right? The man doubts himself. And that's the mistake that we make sometimes. We make it about ourselves and not about Allah. That when we make dua, we may think, I am sinful, I don't deserve this. But it's not about our sin, it's not about what we deserve. It's about the generosity of Allah. It is about how kind, compassionate, loving, and merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So never ever make it about yourself and always make it about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most kind, the most generous, the most giving, the most merciful, the most loving, the most compassionate. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, uh, told this uh, narration, Abdullah Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he said that I could see the, the molar teeth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from laughing, that he was overjoyed. That if these are the blessings of the last person to enter into Jannah, imagine, imagine what those at the forefront are going to have. And obviously we've discussed in the previous hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is going to be the first person to enter into Jannah. You know, imagine what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is going to have. Allahu Akbar. Can you imagine what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Can you imagine that? Allahu Akbar. Like the most beloved of Allah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks him, what do you want? Can you imagine what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him? You know, if we get a, a fraction of that, we will truly be blessed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through his generosity, through his mercy, through his kindness, grant us uh, the many, many blessings of Jannah uh, that cannot even be enumerated. Allahumma amin. Now, we get to hadith number 233. Ali ibn Rabi'ah narrated, I was present when an animal was brought to Ali ibn Abi Talib. When he put his feet on the stirrup, he recited Bismillah. And after he had mounted, he said Alhamdulillah and supplicated, Subhanalladhi sakhara lana hadha wa ma kunna lahu muqrineen wa inna ila rabbina lamun qalibun. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Subhanak. Now let's translate that. 
So he gets onto his horse and he's set, set, he's set in it now. He says, Bismillah. And then he says, Alhamdulillah. And then he supplicated, Subhanallah, he who has subjugated this to us and we could not have otherwise subdued it. And indeed, we to our Lord will surely return. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Subhanak, I have wronged myself, so forgive me as no one can forgive me except you. Subhanak, inni zalamtu nafsi faghfirli fa innahu la yaghfiru dhunuba illa ant. Then he laughed and I asked him, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, what is the reason for your laughing? He replied to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, also supplicated in this manner and thereafter left. I inquired from him the reasoning for laughing. Uh, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah the Most High becomes pleased when his servant says, Rabbi faghfirli fa innahu la yaghfiru dhunuba illa ant. Okay, now let's understand what's happening in this hadith. Ali ibn Rabi'ah, he's talking about his interaction with Ali radiallahu anhu. And Ali radiallahu anhu is the Khalifa at that time. And this shows us that leaders that are in position of political and religious power, they have to lead by example. They have to lead by example because they're being watched and they know that they're going to be emulated. So Ali radiallahu anhu, he's emulating what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did. So he gets onto his horse and he says, Bismillah. This is the equivalent of when you open your car door, you say Bismillah as you're opening the car door. You say Bismillah as you're getting into the seat. As you're getting into the seat. Please excuse me for one second. <coughs> you're saying Bismillah as you open the door. You're saying Bismillah as you get into the seat. And then after he's uh, done that, he says Alhamdulillah. He's thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is intact. His, his ride is intact. Similarly for us, we are intact. Uh, you know, our vehicle, whether it's a car, a motorcycle, a scooter, you know, whatever it is, if you're riding an animal even, Alhamdulillah that you're intact. And then he makes the dua of rukub, the dua of mounting uh, your animal before you before you ride it, which is Subhanallahi, sakhara lana hadha wa ma kunna lahu mukrinin wa inna ila rabbina lamun kalibun. That glory be to Allah who has prepared this transportation for us and we would not have been able to do that for ourselves, and surely to our Lord we shall return. So let us look at what's happening over here. Number one, we're proclaiming the perfection of Allah and how Allah is free from every defect. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His perfection has created these amazing modes of transport. Now let's reflect on this. Early on, it was you were either walking or you were, an, you were on an animal. And then eventually, they invented wheels, and you got a bicycle. Eventually, a car was built. Eventually, uh, a plane came, a boat came, um, helicopters came, you know, everything came. Now we're even at the level of where you can have a car that has no driver, that will be automated driving. And this shows us that that, that is only possible by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His tawfiq. And that is why you're saying that, oh Allah, this is not possible except due to the fact that you have prepared this for us. That if you look at the evolution of transportation, it's purely from the, the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. That we could not have prepared this for ourselves. Uh, and we weren't able to do this for ourselves. We would never be able to do anything for ourselves. And we are in a state of returning to our Lord. And this is a reflection that you know every moment that goes by in life, you're getting closer to your end. Every moment that you that goes by, you're getting closer to meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the reality of it. And that is a reminder that every time you get into your car, your bicycle, your scooter, your motorcycle, whatever it is, you're getting one step closer to that ending. And it's not something you should necessarily be petrified for, but it is something you should be prepared for, right? And by prepared is doing good deeds. And if you've said your dua, before entering your car and your vehicle, it can be hoped that you will be protected and you will, if you are meant to die, inshallah you will die on a good note due to this dua that you have made. And then thereafter he would say, Alhamdulillah, 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 Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And this was just to, to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then to say, Subhanak. And the Prophet ﷺ, um, 
particularly when you're repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the ways that you start off those du'as of repentance is by making tasbih, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect and free from defects, and we as human beings are imperfect and filled with defects. We as human beings are imperfect and filled with defects. So if you look at the du'a of Yunus alayhi salam, what does Yunus alayhi salam say at the bottom of the ocean in the belly of the whale? La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntum min al So, O oh Allah, there's no one worthy of worship except for you, and you are perfect and free from every imperfection, and I have been from the one that has wronged themselves. So you recognize your shortcoming and your mistake. And then he said, uh, That, oh Allah, forgive me, and no one forgives sins except for you. And this is very important to understand that as a, a sinful servant of Allah, we're prone to sin, we're prone to mistake. And as a master, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala naturally forgives and loves to forgive. So much so that when the slave says that, oh my Lord, forgive me, and no one can forgive me except for you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes pleased with it. He becomes happy with it. And that is what caused Ali radiallahu anhu to laugh. And he, when he was asked, why did you laugh? He said, because when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said this, and he was asked, why did you laugh? He said, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala became pleased. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala became pleased. And this shows us that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, again, he would smile for matters of the dunya, but then when it came to matters of the akhirah, that is when you would see the laughter of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his molar teeth showing, with his molar teeth showing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those whom he is pleased with. And this brings us to the last hadith, which is a very important hadith to understand because it can seem very problematic that how do we reconcile the nature of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with what is actually being mentioned. And I think it's very important that as we're studying the shama'il, we have a holistic approach and the correct understanding of these hadith. So hadith number 234, Amr ibn al-Aswad narrated from Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu anhu that Sa'd said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam laughed on the day of the battle of the trench until his teeth showed. I asked Sa'd what caused him to laugh. He replied, a disbeliever had a shield and Sa'd was an archer. He was swaying the shield from side to side to protect his forehead while making derogatory marks of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of Islam and the believers. Sa'd took an arrow and kept it ready in the bow. When the disbeliever exposed his head, he quickly aimed at his forehead and did not miss the target. The enemy immediately fell down with his legs rising into the air. On that, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam laughed until his molar teeth were displayed. I asked, why did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam laugh? He replied, because of what Sa'ad did to that man. Now, knowing who the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was, this seems very uncharacteristic of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So now, what I want to discuss over here is the importance of having a methodology in dealing with a hadith that on their surface seem problematic. So the first thing you always want to ask is, is this hadith authentic? Is this hadith authentic? Anytime you come across a hadith, is it authentic or not? If it's mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari or Sahih Muslim, then inshallah you have nothing to worry about. If it's mentioned in other books of hadith, then you need to see did scholars of hadith actually verify this hadith. Sheikh Al-Bani rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the great scholars of Islam uh, from our generation, and by our generation I mean from this century, he actually has done a verification of a Shama'il al-Tirmidhi, the, you know, the book that we're going through. And when he came across this hadith, he said that this hadith is da'if because Amr ibn al-Aswad is actually unknown. Amr ibn al-Aswad is actually unknown. So that takes care of the first part of the problem, that this hadith is not authentic, and therefore it shouldn't be attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It shouldn't be attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But now, let us just say for argument's sake, if it is hypothetically true, how do we understand this? That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so merciful and so compassionate, yet when this individual is killed, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left. So we've dealt with authenticity. Now it's important to deal with context. Now it's important to deal with context. 
we know from the Quran that there are two types of disbelievers. There are two types of disbelievers. There are those disbelievers that don't know anything about Islam, that perhaps their heart is in the right place and they're just ignorant, that if they're presented with Islam, it is hoped that they would accept Islam. And then there's another category of disbelievers that they know the truth, they've rejected the truth, and they hate everything that Islam stands for. Now this man that was killed, which category is he from? We know with explicit text that he's from the second category. How do we know that? Because he's making fun of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making fun of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not even making fun, cursing Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then cursing and mocking the believers. So this was not a person that was ignorant and their heart is in the right place. This was on the battlefield. They're waging war against the Muslims. Again, this is the Battle of Khandaq. They're waging war against the Muslims. And on that battlefield, he's cursing Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, and the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the believers. Right? So it's from the second category. So this is the person that's trying to harm you and afflict you and destroy you and eradicate your religion. So that is the second con thing that you need to look at is even if it is established in terms of authenticity, context is so important. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would not be happy at the death of a disbeliever. In fact, we see the exact opposite that one day there was a Jewish man whose funeral was proceeding in Medina and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stood up for that funeral. And he said, O Messenger of Allah, why are you standing? This is a, a disbeliever's funeral. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, but was he not a human being? Was he not a human being? So the Prophet Sallallahu showed that respect for humanity regardless of their faith. Yet if they took it to the extreme in terms of their hatred and their animosity, and again in the context of the battlefield, the Prophet Sallallahu was in every due right to be happy at the fact that he was protected, the Ummah is protected, and this person that wanted evil and was wishing evil for them was no longer a threat, was no longer a threat. So number one, establish authenticity. Number two, understand context, understand context. And this is so important that in this day and age, when so many doubts are presented to Muslims, you have to have that sound methodology of establishing authenticity, getting context, referring to scholarly uh, explanation of those hadith so that you can understand what is actually going on. And we learn from this hadith that this hadith actually is not authentic and should not be attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But for argument's sake, if it was, then how do we understand what happened? How do we understand what happened? That is the context behind it. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows best. That brings us to our conclusion for today's chapter. And tomorrow will be our final session, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, on the last night or the last you know, evening of Ramadan, because night would have come in, it's still going to be evening of Ramadan, where we will discuss the reports pertaining to the sense of humor of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what type of sense of humor did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have? We will find out tomorrow. We will find out tomorrow, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, that is going to be at 7 p.m. Mountain Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. And now I'm going to go back and give salams to everyone that sends salams. If anyone has questions, you can ask your questions below, inshallah, and I will try my best to answer them. Bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. So, let us see who we have. Nahida salam wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Triple B wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Lubna Ahmad wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Abu Iqbar wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Love from Malaysia? Well, much love back to you from Canada. I hope you're keeping well. Apa khabar? You always ask me that. Now I get to ask you first. Shahnaz Kabir, wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Amreen Hassan, wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nadia Kazmi, I hope you're still here. I have not seen you since the first night of Ramadan. I pray that you and your family are well, that your, your parents are well, your siblings are well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and protect you all. Uh, Ameen. Um, then we have Shahnaz Kabir, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, Allahu Akbar indeed, saying Ameen. Um Qasim Mustafa, wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And then we have quite a few people coming in and out. Oh, there we go, we have a question. Okay, let's expand this. There we go, okay. So, Ambreen Hassan says, Assalamu alaikum. Sorry, I know this is a little bit off topic, but in light of last week's class, I had another question. In the Indo-Pak culture, it is usually said that Aisha is 17 rak'ahs. 
That is what I have heard. Would you be able to please clarify how many rak'ahs Isha actually is? And also, if it does have four sunnahs in the beginning, how do we read uh, those? Do we read those in two sets of two? Or is it done uh, for the dhuhr? Uh, or is it done as is for the dhuhr, four beginning sunnah, the sunnah zawal and the duha? Same uh, question for the four sunnah regarding the fourth, uh, regarding the sunnahs before Asr time. Excellent. So, the first thing we want to establish is the normal procedure for praying sunnah prayers is that they uh, be prayed two by two, that they be prayed two by two. This is according to the majority of scholars and the majority of madhahib. The exception to this is the Hanafi madhab. The Hanafi madhab said that if there are four sunnah prayers, then they should be prayed as four rak'ahs straight as opposed to being divided two by two. Now, according to prophetic tradition and what we've studied, it seems that the first is closer to the sunnah, where you pray two rak'ahs and make the slim, and then you pray another two rak'ahs and make the slim. But both of them are valid and accepted. Both of them are valid and accepted. Now, in terms of your question about Salatul Aisha, from what we know from last week's class, we learned that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed two before uh, Fajr, and then he prayed four before Dhuhr, so that's six, and then he prayed two after Dhuhr, that's eight, and then two after uh, Maghrib, that's 10, and then he prayed two after Isha, that is 12. So those are what we know from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, is there four rak'ahs before Isha? It has been narrated, but that's not something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam regularly used to do. It is not something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam regularly used to do, and he can do it if you want to. And the Hanafi Madhab, they've actually said that it is a part of the sunnahs of Isha prayer. So that is a valid opinion, and if a person follows that, that is perfectly fine as well. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is praying four sunnahs for Isha before, four uh, fard of Isha, uh, after, and then the Prophet ﷺ is praying two sunnahs. So four and four is eight. Eight and two um, is uh, ten. And then the Prophet ﷺ is praying his witr, which is three, and then another four uh, before his witr, right? So that's how the 17 rak'ahs actually came about. This is inclusive of all of the prayers that the Prophet ﷺ did. Uh, and from the Taraweeh and the Qiyamul Layl and the Tahajjud. So as we mentioned, sometimes he would pray two, sometimes he would pray four, sometimes he would pray six, um, and so on and so forth. So that is how that number of 17 actually came about. Are you required to do that? No. The only thing you're required to do are the four faraid, are the four faraid. Anything that you do more than that is acceptable and is rewarded, is acceptable and is rewarded. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And same thing for before Asr. In the Hanafi Madhab, you would pray for straight um, with the tashahud in between. According to the other Madhab, you would either pray two and two, or you would pray four straight without the first tashahud, without the first tashahud and the second rakah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Mubarak al Fulayyan. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um Qasim uh, Mustafa. Barakallahu feek, wa feek, barakallah. Can you suggest a good book for a teenager on the life of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam? And the answer is yes. The book that I would recommend if they're a very early teenager, like 13 years old, is called When the Moon Split. Uh, it's very short, very easy to read. If they're slightly older, like in the 15, 16 year old range, then I would suggest Revelation um, by Miraj Rabbani, if I think his name is. I can't remember his name, but Revelation is basically the context of Revelation in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is really good. And then also um, the Seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by Adil Salahi uh, for a teenager would be very, very good. Uh, so those are some of the, the good ones that I'd recommend for, for young, uh, for older teenagers, for older teenagers. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala knows best. I'm Bleen Hassan wa Iyaki. No problem, my pleasure, inshallah. So my dear brothers and sisters, that brings us to an end. Just a reminder, tonight is the 30th night of Ramadan, meaning it is the last night of Ramadan for those of you after sunset. If it hasn't sunset yet, this is still Ramadan for you. But after sunset, uh, it is the last night of Ramadan. And the Prophet wasallam said, you know, look for Laylatul Qadr in the last night of Ramadan. 
So it doesn't mean that just because it's the last night you completely give up, but continue to strive hard, continue to make dua, make dua for yourself. Allahumma inna ka'afuwan tuhibbul afwa fa'fu anni. And for our class here today, we say fa'fu anna. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardon us all. Make dua for your loved ones, make dua for your family. Do not forget your brothers and sisters in Palestine. And do not forget our brothers and sisters all across the globe that are struggling. From the Uyghur Muslims uh, in Western China, to those in India, to those in Myanmar, to those in Iraq, to Afghanistan, all over the world. Do not forget the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The least we can do is make a dua for them. If you're able to pray, pray two rak'ahs at least. And more than that, if you're able to, if you're able to give sadaqah, give sadaqah, do whatever you can. But do not let this night go by as a, a lackadaisical, you know, complacent night. That's not the night for it. We'll have many nights like that after Ramadan is over. This is the last night of Ramadan. Let us try our best. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq and accept from us. Amrin Hassan says, does the night before Eid day have any specific acts of worship? Some of the predecessors mentioned that you should try to pray tahajjud and qiyam or layl on it, but nothing is authentically established from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that you should treat it as a regular night of shawal uh, and you should actually get prepared for the day of Eid itself as opposed to doing something in its night. Nothing to the best of my knowledge has been mentioned on that front and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Okay, my dear brothers and sisters, I hope you uh, benefited from this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us all and I'll see you tomorrow. Bi'ithnillah ta'ala. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.